to better your best and your world, you need to dig deep and grow. Join us as top experts, leaders, and creators uncover powerful insights to help you grow in life and in work. And now, your host, Michael McAvoy. Welcome, everybody, to this episode of Dig Deep Grow, the show dedicated to helping you better your best and your world. Today, we're going to be talking about being happier, and I think everybody uh, can appreciate uh, we're all striving uh, toward that, believe it or not. And um, so we're going to be talking with an expert in that area. Uh, that is, uh, we're going to be talking with uh, the professor of uh, behavioral science at the London School of Economics. That's Paul Dolan, Ph.D. Um, and the book is entitled uh, "Happiness." I'm sorry. Let me get the uh, let me get the title. "Happiness by Design: Change What You Do, Not How You Think." So that's the entire title. Uh, Professor, I appreciate your joining me today. Hello there. It's nice to speak to you at uh, 8 o'clock in the evening, UK time. Exactly. Uh, it's a little later in the day for you. So uh, anyway, um, talk about uh, what got you interested in this subject and uh, a little bit about why your viewpoint is a little different from some others. Yeah, so um, who's not interested in happiness? I think you kind of said that just now. Um, and I've spent an, an academic lifetime trying to um, think about how we how we measure the impact of a whole range of activities and experiences on people's lives, um, largely for the purposes of informing policy decisions um, until I started writing this book. And so it kind of naturally led me into thinking about how we can directly capture the impact of these events and circumstances by asking people how they feel. Okay. A better way to find out how someone feels than to ask them. So... That, that is the kind of background to it. And then I guess I kind of uh, waited to write the book, I suppose, until I, until I felt I had something new to say. Um, <coughs> and I guess the two kind of academic contributions in the book um, are essentially, first of all, to distinguish, well, actually to be very clear about what we mean by happiness. And often when we've measured it and thought about it and when people talk about the impact of income on happiness and the such, is they're looking at questions that ask people, essentially how satisfied they are with their lives overall. And that's a, that's the question of a very global um, And I'm much more interested in asking people directly about their experiences, day-to-day, uh, moment-to-moment. And within those experiences, capturing um, what I call purpose that sits alongside pleasure. So um, many of the things that we do in life uh, might not be fun, but filling. So I've been um, teaching my kids the times table this week, um, and, and I can tell you it hasn't been much fun. Uh, <laughs> it's been quite painful, but it has felt like it's been purposeful, and it's felt purposeful in the experience of you know, trying to teach them to do it. Mm -hmm. And just quickly to return to that, it feels a bit abstract, some of that, to quickly return to the evaluation experience um, you know, distinction, um, to tell a little story of a um, friend of mine when we went out for dinner um, during the course of me writing this book and, and she spent the whole of the evening complaining about her boss, her job, her travel to and from her work, her, everyone she worked with. She moaned all evening and then without any hint of irony at the end of dinner she said, of course I love working where I work. <laughs> and, and I think that, that, that there's quite a lot in that. that she was on, on the one hand her experiences day to day, moment to moment were of pain and misery and yet the story she was telling about it was a good organization she was working for, it was a company she always wanted to work for, was that she was having you know, a kind of happy time. And I think that we often pay too much attention to the stories that we tell when we should be paying much more, much more to the actual experiences that we have. So, so that's the first thing. And then just quickly, the second, um, in my training from uh, being trained in economics, really, that um, if you think about a company producing output, uh, it takes its inputs, land, labor, and so on, and it converts them into outputs. Um, and in the same way, we, can, we, we take inputs, money, marriage, sex, and so on, and we convert them into the output of happiness. And we do that by paying attention to them. That's the glue that holds our life, um, holds everything that we do and feel together, is what we pay attention to. So the second contribution in the book 
um, is to talk much more about you know how we pay attention, uh, we allocate it to, in what ways, and the kinds of errors we make when we're trying to imagine and forecast the impact of change circumstances and events on our own happiness. Okay, let's uh, let's start uh, on a point that you just made that. Um, Really, people are not that honest with themselves, or that they've they've created the story, as you say, where right. uh, almost uh, by rote or by uh, you know just saying it over and over again, uh, the story is kind of like what they what they say, um, but there's a totally different thing going on in reality. So I think the awareness uh, that one has about the truth of the matter is an important thing. So, what would you first say to people about uh, being honest as being a good uh, step toward happiness. Yeah, there's always it's every <laughs> every question. Um, I don't want to feel too much like an academic, but I don't want to say on the one hand this and on the other hand that. But no, we don't want to be completely brutally honest with ourselves and other people all of the time, right? Mm. There's quite a, a, a kind of societal benefit as well as an individual benefit in lying to ourselves and other people just a little bit once in a while. So um, we don't want to be completely honest. But I think in terms of the stories that we tell, I think you're absolutely right. We need to need to be much more honest uh, many times about the things that, that actually make us happy compared to those that we think ought to. So sticking with the occupational choice thing, if I said to you, you know, I'm going to leave my job and I'm going to go somewhere else that pays me twice as much money. It'd be like, well, that's kind of obvious, great. Um, if I said to you, I'm going to leave my job and I'm going to go somewhere that's paying me half as much money, you'd be like, uh, why are you doing that? And then I'd have to give you justification and reason, mm -hmm. which actually could be reasons that might make me much happier than the income in the job. It might be that I've got nicer colleagues, that I'm nearer home. All the things that actually might matter much more in my day-to-day -day experiences, but that get kind of lost in the narratives and stuff tells us or that our parents tell us or that we even tell ourselves so so I think being 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 honest insofar as we pay more attention to the feedback that we get about how things make us feel um, I think that's absolutely critical to being happier right so the, the feedback uh, is you know coming externally though so um, you may you make a good example the occupational example is is very good because uh, most of our listeners are entrepreneurs or have you know, a business mindset, and so um, maybe that's a good uh, focus uh, for us. I'm just uh, curious whether if someone is really unhappy in in their job, for instance, um, money in your book is listed as one of the things that can make one happier. So uh, you have a list of them. I think is there 20 items that you? you no, have? well, that's actually just to be clear. That's a question. That's the things that people. I ask people at the start of the book and then at the end to see whether they change. To, to, to pick the things that they think make them happier if oh. they could improve their, their circumstances on those things. Um, but again, you're right about money to some degree, but then also then also wrong, and this is why things get, get a little tricky. It's absolutely clear from, from all happiness data, however it's measured, that poverty makes people miserable. Um, but it doesn't need to be that rich in order to be significantly happier. Mm -hmm. So... In some of the data from the U.S., for example, um, looking at looking at happiness measured uh, much more like how I would like it to be measured in terms of people's experiences and their moods. Um, once you get so there's increasing returns to income up to about seventy-five thousand dollars, and then once you get beyond seventy-five thousand dollars, there's no increase in happiness at all. Hmm. So seven hundred fifty thousand, seven and a half million, um, there's no increase in returns to happiness. So to to uh, income. So I think, and I think a lot of things in life are like that. We we realise the first hit of something actually feels quite good, and in telling the story to ourselves that that every hit thereafter is going to have the same impact. But we get used to things very quickly. Most of what data, most of what the data tells us is there's very quick adaptation to most of what life throws at us, good and bad. That um, I think we kind of misremember the impact of changed circumstances from the past and go on thinking that those impacts will be. You know the same as we move forward. Okay, what would you say are, uh, are the main uh, drivers of happiness? You know, put in a in a pretty simple. If you're going to label two or three things that people yeah. people would need to focus on. Well, it's interesting. I mean, you, it's very it's nice that you just use the word focus on. So I return to the central thesis, if you like, of paying attention. You know, it's I kind of feel like I should say sorry about for for what I'm about to say because it sounds really glaringly obvious, but. You pay attention to the things that make you happy, and you don't pay attention to the things that don't. Um, 
Now, that does sound obvious, but often we don't do what's obvious. So be happier when we're paying attention to what we're doing and who we're doing it with. It's kind of like being mindful, but without the mindfulness training. You know, you kind of get to pay attention to the moment, to the activities that you're engaged in, and to the people that you're doing them with. Um, so therefore, avoid being distracted. And so um, the modern age is making that incredibly difficult for us, right? So you're sitting there, you're at dinner, and your mobile phone goes off, you, you, you have a Facebook update or a text or an email, and your attention or energy is taken away from the pleasure and purpose of the conversation towards your you know, Facebook update, and, and that takes energy. It's costly. Um, it involves a lot of energy from your brain, which actually likes to be lazy, and it makes you less happy, makes you more tired, and actually oftentimes it's very rude. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of designing environments that make it harder for us, actually, I think, in, in many ways. Yeah, Do the obvious. Yeah, that, that, that sounds like, you know, um, simple. Living simply sometimes <laughs> can can uh, make one happier. I think that's what you're alluding to in the, in society as it is today. It's uh, there are so many uh, stresses, and uh, you know we we're motivated to do things to keep up and that kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, the reason it's called happiness by design is because you know I think so many books on happiness, and especially in the self help genre are essentially about trying to think yourself happy, you know, just be positive or something, right? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I kind of work that out. That's why I'm buying this book. Um, <laughs> and then how do I do that? Well, of course, there's no kind of practical tools to help you do it. Um, you're made mi more miserable because you can't do it, so you go and buy another self-help book. Um, and instead, you need to design environments that make those actions easier. The whole of behavioral science, really, I, t I try and summarize it in, in, you know, something else. If you want to do something, make it easier. And if you don't want to do it, make it harder. Um, but actually, we design our environments that often it's the other way around. We make it very hard, hard for ourselves to do things we that would make us happy and very easy for us not to. And I think um, the internet use is one. So if, if someone asks me why do people do, the answer to that question is because they can. So you know, lots of good data um, showing that you know people gain more weight, especially pregnant women gain more weight when they live near takeaways. Um, People are much more likely to eat more, to cheat more in a whole range of different contexts when there's opportunity to act in those ways. Um, and so, it's, you know, with the internet, it's about taking control. Of, of course, the internet's a great thing and it's a wonder and everything, but um, we don't want to be on it all the time. So we need to find ways of designing environments, not just with the internet, but with all the other things that we do that make it easier for us to consume these activities and these experiences in the right measure. Okay. Um, in uh, in the uh, on your chapter four, you talk about uh, why aren't we happier, and I'm going to ask you to go into a little of that. But um, th uh, first, on the occupational uh, question again, um, there are two camps that say one that says do what you love, uh, and the other says um, just just do something, and you you'll gain in uh, knowledge and expertise, and that will lead to the next thing. So you know, don't tear your hair out over these things. W where do you come down on that debate? Yeah. Again, so what you what you don't so there's a couple of routes into answering that question. What you don't want to do, you don't want to make the mistake of things by focusing attention on being happier, right? So if I, in an experiment, if I ask you to listen to some music and and say to you, now whilst you do this, really try and hard, try and try hard to be happy, <laughs> you're you're not going to enjoy it as much as if you just listen to the music and you know let the pleasure come naturally. Um, so you don't want to be paying undue attention to being happier in your occupational choice or in anything else. But at the same time, you really don't want to be. I have a, a line in the book that has resonated with a, with a few people which says, lost happiness is lost forever. And the point I'm trying to make there is that it's not fungible like money. You can't, you can't kind of more for tomorrow um, because misery is misery. If you're making yourself miserable on the journey to the summit of some kind, then... Well, you better be pretty damn sure that it's going to be. You're going to be very happy when you get to the summit, um, because you're giving up a lot in order to get there. And often, when you get there, of course, the summit doesn't look quite as nice as it did when you were thinking about what it would look like when you get there. Um, and you might not even get there anyway. So uh, we need to be very, very careful about what we give up in order to achieve or to be, 
you know, successful in some objectively measurable sense. So I would say enjoy that. It sounds a cliche, but, you know, enjoy the journey. I think that's absolutely critical. But I think once you add, once we add purpose into the mix, some of the things that people do that might, on the face of it, seem silly, make more sense. I mean, if you can think of, you know, elite athletes who, you know, training hard in the pouring down of rain at 5 a.m. in the morning, there doesn't seem to be very much pleasure in that. But... But I think even in that lactic acid or in the you know misery of the of the of the pain that they go through, there's something that feels quite purposeful in that, mm-hmm. and it feels purposeful in the experience. That's the critical thing that I want to say. It's not it's not purposeful in a big grand narrative sense, a story that we tell about ourselves about our lives having meaning. My meaning for my children doesn't come when I you know sit in my chair and think how meaningful my life is because I have kids. It comes from teaching them the times table. It comes from engaging in activities with them that feel purposeful Mm -hmm. and so I think that once we add purpose into the mix then some of the things that people may appear to be sacrificing happiness for become more explicable so yeah so it sounds like the purpose side of things uh, is more uh, in things that not uh, are in things that are not necessarily going to give you pleasure but um, you when you focus on the idea that this this has an, an outcome that it has a purpose that that you know, after the fact is probably going to lead to some pleasure of satisfaction. Yeah, and it, but it feels purposeful at the, at the time. So, you know, it's kind of a nice example, I think, of writing the book. I mean, it was, you know, it was a bit of fun on the way, but it was it mostly felt felt purposeful. Mm-hmm. Um, and it felt purposeful at the time, but my memory of how purposeful it was will be driven by how many <laughs> book sales I get. So <laughs> if the book... If the book was a flop, then it'd be like, well, that was a waste of time. Um, but whereas if it's a massive success, which obviously it will be, um, then uh, mm-hmm. then I'm going to think that was that was that was really worth it. But of course, it doesn't change the experience at the time because at the experience of time, there wasn't even a book. So um, the actual experience can be sometimes quite different from our reconstruction of it based upon further knowledge and information that we have after the fact. Well, on that note, I'll, I'll uh, reiterate that the book we're talking about with Paul Dolan is Happiness by Design, his new book, and uh, that is available everywhere now. So uh, I think Paul gave you the cue to go out and get it, so that <laughs> I'll say that. <laughs> All right, so... Uh, well, well you, you, you actually made that very clear, so good, excellent. <laughs> very good, yeah. All right, so um, I wanted to get to the point about why aren't we happier. Um, yeah. you, you mentioned desires, projections, and beliefs. Uh, yeah. Go into a little bit about that. Yeah, so mistaken desires. I think we've I think we've touched on them. It's the idea that we should be driven by success and achievement simply for themselves, mm-hmm. as if as if they as if they matter in their own right. And my argument is that they they only matter insofar as they bring happiness. And if you're giving up other things that would make you happy on the journey to the summit, then you need to ask yourself whether it's worth it. You know, people who climb Everest. Um, you know, there's not a there's there's an interesting question about whether that's worth it. You know, there's uh, most of the accidents, appear, as you as you may know, I think about three quarters of the accidents uh, happen on the way down. So there's not even the pleasure of being on the peak because they've got the worst bit to come next. So so there's a real question about whether the desire for achievement and um, success is a is a kind of sensible one uh, in itself. Um, the projections is um, where there's been most of the work in psychology, I suppose, is is looking at this idea that. We're not particularly good at being able to um, project how things are going to impact on us when they happen. We're, we're not particularly bad. Actually, that's not true. I mean, we're not we're not particularly bad at being able to estimate that immediate impact. We're just not very good at knowing how long that impact will last. So, you know, if we come back to to the pay rise example or something, you know, you you imagine a pay rise making you happier. Well, actually, the pay rise does when you first get the pay rise. But you quickly withdraw attention from it as it becomes old and established. You you kind of read the pay slip. You you make sense of it. You you think it should have been more. Um, <laughs> and and you go back to watching the X Factor, or eating pizza, or arguing with your children. And all of those things that draw attention are now much more significant than the than the um, attention that you pay the pay rise. And one of the things that we find it really hard to be able to do is to imagine how much something will affect us when we're not paying attention to it because that's kind of almost impossible for our brains to do so we we necessarily think that most of the things that life throws at us will be better and worse than turns out to be true in the experience although there are some things like um, street noise for example you you might think 
oh, I'm going to move into this lovely flat. It's a bit noisy on the road, but I'll get used to that traffic noise. Well, the evidence uh, tends to suggest that you won't if that noise is uncertain and random. There's a lot of in nature to uncertainty. And if car horns are going off you know, at random times, then your mind is unconsciously and you know, quite consciously drawn to that noise. So we're not particularly good at being able to forecast how long the impact of a change circumstance will last. Um, and then mistaken beliefs. This is the trickier one in a way because it's this idea that we need to um, accept. I mean, if you look at most of the therapies, really, CBT therapies, mindfulness therapies, um, psych psychiatric therapies, they're all really essentially about acceptance, really. It's the first, you know, it's the, I think, whatever of the alcoholic thing is this yes. access that you have a drink, drink problem. So there is this liberating effect of acceptance. And so we need to sometimes get rid of, and actually most of the time, get rid of these mistaken beliefs that we might have about ourselves. You know, I might think I'm a fantastic cook and keep making horrible meals for friends who never turn up for dinner, you know, which I should accept that I'm not very good at it. <laughs> uh, and um, so, so, so we need to kind of, and I think that's where some of the stories that we tell about ourselves and about the things that we think make us happy come from. Um, and as we said at the start, you know, the kind of top of the show, if you like, um, some of the, the kind of barriers to us being happy, except some of those stories are not necessarily true for our happiness. Is there any research uh, that you've uh, discovered that shows that, for instance, people who know that they're, uh, that let's just say they're 10 years into a career job that they thought was going to take them to the summit, as you said, and, and they realize they're miserable, but, um, you know, they're comfortable, so to speak. Uh, is there any research to show that uh, for the people who, um, you know, take the, have the courage to leave um, their a job that they're not happy with, that they, regardless of where they end up, whether they're happy down the line a bit? Yeah, a really difficult point in that question is to establish the cause and effects and to know what the counterfactual would look like, right? So you'd never... You never really know, because you can't know mm -hmm. for any one individual how happy they would have been had they done something different. <laughs> yeah. So, so that's a really scientifically problematic uh, point. What we can do is look at some of the actions that might, where where there are data from different studies, and we can kind of cobble together evidence from a whole range of contexts, including experiments and field trials and longitudinal data, where we might be able to tell a story. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that, that one of the reasons why. Um, and I talk in the book about knowing when to hold and fold. I mean, that's really essentially what you're what you're asking about yes. to know when to when to when to hold or you know you know hold them or fold them. Yes. And and I think I think if you're if you're already thinking about whether you should hold them or fold them, it's probably an indication that you might really seriously think about folding them, because once you start thinking about what another world might look like, mission seeking, and so. Um, if you, it, it, whereas, whereas if you do something, if you bite the bullet, the worst that can happen is it turns out badly and you get over it. <laughs> mm -hmm. So the mind is very good. We're very good at making sense of things that have happened, um, but we're not particularly good. At, we, we, we pension to how the world might be. So you're always going to be kind of questioning, oh, what, you know, what would have happened had I taken that change? Had, had I done that? Had I moved somewhere else? Had I... Whereas if you actually do it, as I say, it might turn out really well, but even if it doesn't, you'll get used to it, you'll get over it because you can make sense of it. So I would, I would typically say, I mean, of course, this is not generalizable advice and I wouldn't like to, you know, <laughs> kind of advise people to, to change their life in this way. I'm just trying to set out in the book some tools that they might use in order, or, you know, kind of framework in which they might use to think about these kinds of decisions. But but I think that, you know, as I say, if you're at your point of where you're really seeing out the change, it's probably time to make the change. Right. So any any time anyone says, "I'm thinking of," <laughs> that you pretty, they probably already already know the answer. Uh, but it does take yeah. some it does yeah. some, take some courage sometimes. Um, anyway, let's. It does. It does, and it takes some courage when you're swimming. Actual expectations. I think that's uh, that's that's one of the challenges that we talked about earlier. You know, the stories that are that we tell and that are told for us. Um, you know, it could be it could be very hard, and of course, there can be quite a lot of misery in 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 swimming against the tide. It's very effortful and hard work, so sometimes it's easier for us to go with the flow. Right, and uh, and along the way of making changes, uh, 
you can often second guess and uh, sometimes uh, sabotage because of that. Um, so uh, I think if you, uh, I'm, we're going to get to the to the actual laying out of some practical ideas for people now, um, and that is uh, you have decide, design, and do three areas that people need to focus on. So go ahead and, and say a little about that. Yeah, so uh, th there seems to be a logical structure to, to, to them. When I, when I was writing the book, chapters moved around a lot in the course of that, and it, uh, a kind of uh, order appeared obvious at the end. So first of all, you need to think about the kinds of decisions that you're, that you're making or taking, and um, think seriously about whether, you know, by getting feedback about how these affect your happiness, by getting feedback from other people. Other, other people can be a very useful source of information about what, um, circumstances and events and changes might be like. I think we're a lot less trusting of other people than we might be. Um, I think it's because we we are all special, but we're just not as special as we think we are. Mm -hmm. um, the, a lot of the impact of these things are quite universal. Um, so other people's experiences are um, can be can be very very helpful. There was a study that looked at the uh, how how much women like being on certain dates with men based upon whether they were judging it on how they thought the date would go compared to other women's experiences of going on the date with that guy. Mm -hmm. And other women's experiences were a much more useful guide for their own experience than how they thought it would go. Uh -huh. So um, so what we need to we need to get assuming that we've kind of thought about making the right decision in terms of its impact upon our happiness or you know happiness of those that we care about, we then need to because we haven't really touched on this 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 much, but two decades of research in Economic psychology and neuroscience have taught us a very basic fact that that most of what we do simply comes about rather than being thought about. We are driven by unconscious and automatic processes, uh, much more than by definition our conscious minds are aware. And our brain is lazy and wants to wants to make habits. It wants to create habit loops. It's why you'll sometimes check whether you've locked the house or turned the it's done automatically, mm -hmm. um, and when you think about it consciously, you're not sure whether you've actually done it or not. Yes. So, so you can only, and this goes back to an early point I made. You can't, you can't think yourself happy. Um, what you can do, though, I think, is you can think about how you can design environments that make it easier for you to be happier without having to think about it. Mm -hmm. So, we are influenced by a whole range of contextual influences. You know, um, lots of studies around eating. You know, that people eat less when they have smaller plates. They eat less when they use their their left hand if they're right-handed because they have to pay attention to to what they're eating. There's all these things that um, we we're more likely to tidy up after ourselves if we've got citrus lemon smells in the room. Um, we're more likely to buy French wine if French music is playing in the background. All of these things have have shown us that there there are a whole range of these priming effects that influence us hugely. Mm -hmm. So could you not use some of these effects in your own lives? To make it easier for you to be happier without you having. So that's the design uh, chapter. Um, another important element within that, though, just very quickly, is um, we we are all social animals, in spite of the fact that we might say otherwise. We we take our cues for our actions from what people like us do. So uh, you know, again, a kind of obvious insight, if you like, is that if you want to to make yourself more likely to do something, um, surround yourself with people that are doing those things, and. Um, and you'll do them kind of automatically without then having to, to think about, um, you know, effortfully doing them. And then in terms of the do, we've, again, also touched on this. This is the idea that you're, you're, you're nearly always happier when you're paying attention to what you're doing and who you're doing it with. And um, there are, some again, some really obvious things that I feel like I need to say sorry for about here. And this is where this is, you, you do see some of this stuff in other books, but what they don't give you is the, is the framework in which to do it. You know, if you said to people... Listening to music, playing some songs and tunes that you like uh, hearing. Does that? Of course it does. Well, why don't you do more of it? Uh, good idea. And then you don't. So you mm -hmm. need to kind of find ways of, 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 of making listening to music, for example, something that you do automatically. You know, design it into your life. Set a radio station to, you know, to come on at a particular time in the day. To, mm -hmm. you know, prompt yourself. Get a... Uh, a, you know, notification on your phone to listen to something on Spotify or, or you know, something like that. Ways that, that make some of these obvious insights much more likely to happen because we just forget. Okay, so you mentioned environment and I think that this is a very practical thing. You, you, you've mentioned some things that, you know, even if we don't 
if we don't think about it from moment to moment each day, if we design a few things in to our day, perhaps uh, you know the people who we meet with or uh, having a particular kind of food that we like. Um, is there any? Is, do you, in your book do you have uh, a list of of items that you could address or work into your design? Anything like that? Well, I do. I don't, I'm not sure the level of the question. I mean, so I do have some of the the things that are universal, like listening to music, helping helping other people. By the way, for purpose, that's really that's really that's, that's a really powerful impact on how we feel. I, I, you know, but helping other people is a really selfish thing to do. Makes you feel good, right? <laughs> yeah, it makes you feel good. It makes you feel good. So celebrate that. You know, remind yourself of that. Um, and not only will you benefit yourself, you might also help other people on the way too. So I think it's kind of designing in the feedback and in the situations that you place yourself in, um, making these kinds of actions much more likely. And that's why um, you know it's change what you do, not how you think. I think we all know, you know, we we most of us know some, most of these things, but we just don't do them. Mm -hmm. And so it's just ways of designing them into your lives that make them much more likely. And you can have you can have really significant effects for a very small change. Um, you know, I I, um, I listen to music on my commute into the LSE by by having bought some headphones. You know, by just literally just. But it was because I was just walking home one evening, not going the same way as I normally do, and I walked past the past this headphone shop and went in and. You know, Books are sometimes quite random mm -hmm. uh, in terms of their impact. There's nothing really conscious about that. I just kind of walked in, bought them, and now I do something that makes me happier. So it's kind of you know taking a step back and thinking about how you can create the environments in ways that make those actions much more likely to take place, um, rather than rather than thinking long and hard about them and you know kind of and, and also changing your life. You don't need to change your life. I know again it sounds like an obvious piece of advice, but if you spent five minutes every day or ten minutes every day talking to someone that you liked uh, more than you do right now, we'd all be happier, um, irrespective of our underlying level. So why don't we do that? Well, I, I've got a friend that lives overseas. We we speak to one another at 3 p.m. every Thursday, and uh, we do that every Thursday at 3 p.m. Mm -hmm. And if we don't, we, we, we it's just now automatic for us. To, to have an alternative time that we speak. It's just built into our lives. Mm -hmm. It's making habit loops out of things, um, creating habits, just making it easy for our automatic brain just to kind of run rip and for our conscious mind to switch off. Right. That, that That's an interesting way you put it. A habit loop, is that what you said? It is a habit loop, yeah. So, so we know... Um, you know that, that that we are creatures of our environment of habits. We we get used to doing things, and so if you can find a way of creating a habit, um, then you're just going to do it without thinking about it. And and again, that comes from just making it easy. Um, you know, if you uh, again, uh, you know, some something's quite quite obvious. If you want to run in the mornings, you know, make sure the trainers are visible and by the bed and clearly. You know, you you kind of got to fall over them before you can do anything else. You know, it's just gonna just give you that little bit of a nudge in the right direction, and then then once you start doing it, you you just will often will often you know, okay. Uh, as I say, the brain wants to conserve energy um, and and make life easy for you. So, um, uh, sports stars are a very nice example. Again, you know they. They they think very consciously and effortfully about playing that golf shot or hitting that tennis ball, and then that gets encoded into their system one, as it's called, by Kahneman, um, who's written the forward to my to my book. He's the author of Thinking Fast and Slow, and um, it, in, it gets encoded into system one, and it becomes a habit. And the worst thing a tennis player can do um, is to then start consciously thinking about their tennis shots. That's when they choke. So you don't want to, once you've encoded it as a habit, you don't then want to think about it again. You just want to just let it run rip. You just keep playing the tennis shots over and over without what appears to be like any effort. And the same thing comes to happiness. You consciously you know, work hard at playing the right stroke to begin with. You get your environment in place, first mm -hmm. of all. You, you choose your you make the right kinds of commitments. You prime yourself with the right kinds of smells and colors and sounds. Mm -hmm. And then you just get on with it without having to think um, effortfully. One of the things that um, a lot of people think about happiness and other things is that in order for it to work and be successful or even worth it, is that it has to be effortful. And I think, well, why? 
Why mm-hmm. does it have to be effortful? Why can't I? Why can't I make it easy? I'd like to make happiness easy. That makes total sense. Um, talking with uh, Paul Dolan, author of Happiness by Design: Change What You Do, Not How You Think. Now, I have a, I'm gonna have one more question for you, um, and this is: What question have I not addressed, or what? It, what let's say either another tip or an idea that we have not covered that you think would be helpful for people. Yeah, that's a really good. I mean, I think we've gone we've gone through. I mean, Mike, you've done a fantastic job of of, of kind of getting me to talk through. Um, many many aspects of the book. Can I, let me let me return just the principal thing again. That um, and just I, I kind of make this a little personal to, to end with. So so I come from what we might call in Britain a working class background, where where lots of my experiences of life um, and the people that I grew up around were they had lots of pleasure, but but and we, you know we had some really good parties and things when I was a kid, but but not 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 a great deal of purpose. And then I go and become an academic, and I work at institutions like the LSE, and I come to Princeton, and I see lots of people that have a lot of experiences of purpose in their life that could be happy if they just had a bit of fun. Mm-hmm. And and I think getting that balance right is critical, or thinking about that balance, and just thinking about you know what and it's not going to be the same balance of pleasure and purpose for uh, for each of us. Some of us will be more pleasure machines, others more purpose engines. But I think. It's, it's kind of trying to find a way in which we have experiences of life. The things we do, again, it comes back to what we do, not how we think. Mm-hmm. To have experiences of life that we find pleasurable on the one hand and other activities that we find relatively purposeful. Uh, so it's to kind of to bring us back to where we started, I suppose. Yeah, and uh, probably asking yourself the question at any moment in your day, uh, is this pleasure, pleasurable or purposeful? And if you find yourself uh, answering, "This is boring, and I hate this," <laughs> that <laughs> yeah, would, would be an obvious. Yeah, worse than doing something that feels pointless, right? right? I mean, that's and that's critical to designing not only to our own lives, but thinking about that as policymakers or companies and organisations. You need to ensure that you're giving feedback to your employees, to your staff, to the population, that what they're doing, even if that project is terminated or it comes to an end, has been worthwhile, and there's some something useful in that process of doing it. There's nothing, nothing worse than, uh, than doing something that feels pointless. Uh, I remember when I, was a, when I was a kid at school, I used, to, I used to talk a lot in class, and I, and I was always given lines, which made me to write out a hundred times, I must not talk so much. And I wrote that out, and then the teacher would tear it up in front of me. Mm-hmm. And, and the, that, that was the whole point of that. <laughs> so, of that. Um, and that does feel horrible. It feels horrible when something you've done, even if it's just writing out a hundred lines of "I must not talk so much," yes. <laughs> is torn up in front of your face. So I think we need to think carefully about ensuring that we feel that we feel purpose that sits alongside pleasure. Perfect. Well, Paul, hey, thanks for uh, talking about your book. This is a, a subject that is, uh, you know, there's dozens of books that that are coming out, as you said earlier, but. Um, it is an area where we have a choice to make, and so for those uh, for those of us who actually want to be uh, designing our lives a bit better, uh, this is a perfect way to go. So uh, the book is called Happiness by Design: Change What You Do and Not How You Think, and that's by Paul Dolan. You can find that anywhere. Uh, so Paul, once again, thank you for joining me. Thank you, Michael. Thank you very much for your time. You can find all of our episodes at digdeepgrow.com. Uh, We're also on iTunes, Stitcher, and uh, various other uh, networks for podcasts at that. So uh, just do a search on Dig Deep Grow and you'll find us. Um, We'll see you next time, everybody.